I'm Michael Yardney, and this is the first of a series of webcasts that I'm doing with my friend Tom Corley about the rich habits and the poor habits of people. We're going to try and work out why the rich keep getting richer and the poor, unfortunately, uh, keep uh, staying where they are. So I'd like to welcome across uh, in the United States my good friend Tom Corley. Hello, Tom. Hey, Michael. How are you doing today? Great, thank you. And this is, I'm looking forward to this series of webcasts. Tom, you, I know that you are a best-selling author. Your book, Rich Habits, was the first of a series of books you're doing, and it's become an Amazon number one bestseller. You're on many TV shows. You're frequently in Yahoo Finance and Business Insider, and your, your blogs get millions and millions of views. But Tom, let's go back a step. Maybe you could tell me what made you first study as a CPA? What made you first study why the rich keep getting richer in their habits? Yeah, you would think, Michael, it's completely outside my comfort zone. But, uh, you know, I was raised uh, in a rich household. Uh, and then we lost everything overnight. It's a long story and it's a heartbreaking story. Uh, and, um, you know, it almost put my father over the Brooklyn Bridge, literally. Uh, he was thinking about suicide after everything just collapsed. Uh, but he had 11 in the family to raise. And so he just uh, buckled his belt and went back to work. Uh, and we were poor. We were poor for a long, long time. I, I in fact, didn't have any savings until uh, I got married. And it was, you know, what we've gotten from the wedding. That was the first amount of money that I ever had. Everything that I earned while I was a janitor during college went to pay for my college tuition. Uh, and uh, you know, it was just uh, going from being rich to being just horribly poor and struggling just to pay bills and, and the stress that that causes, Michael, uh, I guess it formed, uh, you know, a long-term memory that was released or lit on fire when um, a small business client came into my office he broke down in tears and, and he asked me, what am I doing wrong? He was going bankrupt. Uh, and, uh, you know, as a CPA, you try and use your, your technical knowledge and your, your skills to help them understand what they're doing wrong. But the, the real truth of the matter was that he just had bad habits. And that set me on a course of studying the habits of the rich and the poor. And I spent five years doing that. Uh, and and then I studied 233 rich people and 128 poor people and taught about a dozen of the what I call these learning sessions for the Rich Habits training program. And people had such a profound, it had such a profound impact on, on the people in the class that they um, asked me to write a book about it, to share it with the world. And so uh, I did. And, and Rich Habits was the first book that I came out with. It was really a story based book trying to um, teach the 10 core or keystone habits that I thought were the most profound. But, um, you know, it was really being rich, being poor. And uh, we, I just wanted to answer two questions, Michael. The, the first question was, why is, why is it that some people are rich and some people, people are poor? And the second question is, what do rich people and poor people do from the minute that they wake up in the morning? until the minute that they put their head on the pillow. I wanted to cover their entire day. And what, after I did that research, I was shocked that the answer lied in their habits. Um, it, it wasn't anything profound. It was their little, little daily habits. My story was similar in that over my, in my childhood, we didn't start rich and became poor. We became poor as immigrants to Australia. And I found it interesting that a lot of my friends' parents were rich. I guess that meant my parents' friends were rich also. And they went on vacation and we didn't. They had cars and we didn't until I was older. My father didn't have his first automobile until I was 10 or 12. Um, they went on summer vacations. Uh, they had businesses. They had uh, a, a property in and so I learned a lot of habits from my parents' friends. Uh, my father's uh, financial plan was sitting at the kitchen table on a Saturday morning, uh, writing out. I remember he used to sit there smoking a cigarette and drinking his black coffee, and he was um, 
he was planning what he'd do when he won the lottery. He wrote down every Saturday what he'd be spending his lottery money on. And uh, he always won a little bit, Tom, not enough to get out of the rat race, but enough to buy some more lottery tickets for the next week. And that was his financial plan. So I wanted to study the wealthy people and the rich people. And uh, I guess I learned similar things. They had habits, but they also thought differently. They had different languages. They spoke about different things. They had different ideas. And that's what I'd like to be discussing with you over this series of uh, webcasts that we're going to be doing. But Tom, maybe you could share just in this first video, a couple of the habits that the rich people have, and we'll discuss some of the others in subsequent videos. Well, you know, one of the most important habits that I uncovered was that the rich pursued some dream, some stretch goal, uh, or some purpose in life. 61% of them went, you know, went after something. They took a risk, Michael. You know, they, they, they just, I think out of, out of disgust because most of them were, most of the rich were, were poor or in the middle class, stuck in the middle class. So they were self-made. I think that's a really good lesson, Tom. The fact that wherever you are today, wherever, whatever your financial circumstances are, most self-made millionaires in Australia and in the United States, when you look at the various rich lists, the magazines come out, some were born with a silver spoon in their mouth, but the majority actually worked their way up, didn't they? So there's a chance yeah. for everybody. You know, I, I always um, was under the impression that in just from listening to the media, reading the media, that uh, wealth, wealthy people were wealthy because their parents were wealthy. I just assumed that that's the way it worked in the world. And what I found out in my research was the exact opposite. In fact, most of the wealthy, 177 out of the 233 wealthy people were self-made. They came from either poverty or the middle class. And so uh, they, they had to figure it out somehow, Michael. They, they had to break free of their limiting beliefs, of their bad habits. Uh, and so um, I, I just thought that was profound to me because I came from po poverty for the most part. And I thought, well, if they can do it, you know, why can't I do it? That's a good question. And you started to say they have a dream. I think we all have dreams. You get in the shower and you have dreams. But I, I found the difference between the rich people and the average person is they don't just have dreams, but they have plans. They take action. They write down their goals and then they pursue them. So they know where they're heading. And this is because in your mind, you've got what I call, what, what scientists call the reticular activating system. And that's your own internal GPS. You know, you drive down the road and all of a sudden you see all the white cars because you're looking at white cars or you buy a new refrigerator. So all of a sudden, all the advertisements seem to be for refrigerators. It's your internal GPS, your internal um, reticular activating system focusing on what you're after and on the opposite, actually filtering out what you're not after, Tom. Yeah, that, that's, it's interesting that you meant, mentioned the reticular activating system because um, I've done a lot of research on uh, neurology and brain science, you know, how the brain works because habits are driven by the basal ganglia and a couple of other areas of the brain. And one of the areas that kept popping up with respect to goal setting and pursuing dreams was the reticular activating system. And what I found out was that the way the RAS works is um, just imagine you're in an airport and there's just, you know, hundreds of people and they're talking and it's all just white noise to you, Michael, right? But then all of a sudden someone screams out, hey, Michael, and you immediately turn your head. That's the reticular activating system. It's focused on things that are important to you. That's why it's so critical to pursue goals and to pursue dreams because it activates or it turns on, it toggles on the reticular activating system, which is part, part of the limbic system. It's part of your subconscious mind. And that goes to work behind the scenes, uh, picking up all the sensory information that the conscious mind, the, the neocortex, it is just um, not seeing at all. So, so this reticular activating system is like a team of people working uh, full time, 24 seven around the clock, trying to be, make you become successful. So what makes them go to work is, is pursuing a dream or a stretch goal. What's the difference between a dream and a goal, Tom? Well, so goals, you build goals around your dreams. So the idea is you define 
your ideal perfect life, whatever it is. And that, that, of course, is made up of a series of dreams that you want to realize in life. Then you pick one dream and you build goals around it. You might, each dream might have five, six, ten goals that you need to pursue. And then what you do with those goals is you, you build daily habits or what I call habit goals around those goals so that you can accomplish each individual goal. And, and if you uh, attack your goals every day through these daily habit goals, you'll achieve that goal. And then you move on to the next goal and then the next goal. And when you're done achieving all of the goals, you've realized your dream. That's one rung on the ladder. You have other rungs on the ladder, other dreams on your ladder of success. Uh, so you, then you pursue the next dream. You create goals around that. You create ha daily habit goals ar around those goals. Tom, a lot of people have dreams. Everyone thinks they have a goal. But how important is it to write it down? Well, I think the act of writing it down is important for, for, two, for two reasons. One is um, it gets your mind to uh, – it activates different parts of your mind. Now, you're, you're not just uh, using, you know, the prefrontal cortex, which is the, you know, decision and control center and the planning center. You're actually – when you write, you're activating the back part of the brain, uh, and the back part of the brain then – is linked to the basal ganglia, the reticular activating system, all sorts of areas of the brain. Uh, and when you write, you, f you are actually engaging other parts of the brain. The other reason that you want to write it down is it's almost like when you do something over and over again. So you're not only thinking about the goals, but now you've written it down and then you have a piece of paper that you can look at and review that, those goals uh, all the time. It doesn't mean you're going to achieve the goals because goals require action. You, know, you can't just write down a goal and just say, okay, uh, I'm good. You have to take action. That's where the daily habit goals come into play. Uh, but once, once you have the goal written down, you have, you've actually created a mini plan for yourself. Even though that mini plan might be for six months, it might be a temporary uh, goal, a goal that you know, is only going to last six months and then you move on to the next goal. But that's, you want to write down your goals because it activates multiple parts of the brain and it, it uh, through, creates a repetition, uh, a habit, a, a loop, a, a mental loop that goes on between the hypothalamus and the prefrontal cortex. And clearly you can have goals in various elements of your life and to have a balanced life you need goals in not just finances and rich that we're talking about, but also health, also family, spirituality, contribution, uh, personal growth uh, and that's why I found most successful people have a, a whole list of goals that they work on and as soon as they reach them they replace them with new ones Tom. I, I think that's uh, the key I think the I think the whole process of being successful is about defining your dreams setting your goals and then creating actions daily actions to make those goals a reality it's not really that complicated where it gets complicated, Michael, is that people uh, – see, in order to pursue a goal, you have to have uh, the requisite knowledge and the skill sets in order to accomplish that goal. And I think where many people fail in achieving their goals is they set these audacious goals uh, and, they do, and they lack the skills and the knowledge in order to achieve the goals. So you, you need to ask yourself – a question when you set a goal. Do I have the knowledge and the skill sets to achieve this goal? Do, do I have what it takes to pursue this goal? And I think that's where most people get it wrong. Tom, I remember that when I first read your book, you were discussing good habits, bad habits, rich habits, poor habits. I learned it in a different way. I remember first reading uh, Science of uh, Getting Rich by Wallace Wattles. It was written almost a century ago where he said, your thoughts lead to your feelings, your feelings lead to your actions, and your actions lead to your results. So your inner world, your thoughts and your feelings lead to your outer world, your, your actions and your results. You're telling me that they manifest in habits. And one of the things I learned from reading your work was that good habits may be hard to form, but they're easy to live with, while bad habits are easy to form but once you've got them, they're hard to live with. 
So in future of these videos, I'd like to work through each of those habits with you, the things that you've learned, so we can uh, teach the viewers of this series of videos uh, how to form some good habits. So just uh, to leave a sneak preview for the future, how easy is it to form a new habit, Tom? It's, it's not easy, um, but there are tricks, Michael, to fool the brain. You see, when you try and form a new habit, the brain fights you. Uh, you. You're actually using willpower energy to form a new habit. That's a, a, re a recipe for a failure. You cannot use willpower to form a new habit. What you have to do, or what I found in my research, is you have to hijack existing habits. For example, let, let's say you drink coffee like I do uh, twice a day, and you want to form the habit of uh, drinking water because water is healthy for you. Uh, and so uh, what you do then is you take your coffee cup, put it on the, the, the water cooler, and after two days, Michael, you will actually have formed a joint habit. They call it habit stacking. Uh, it's like the way the brain works is you have a habit. It's, it's a neurological uh, a series of neurons firing together like on a train track. Uh, and there's a train running along there. That's the habit. It's got cabooses. You open up the caboose and you put your new habit in that caboose. The brain will not fight you on it at all. It will, uh, you'll adopt that habit almost within a day or two. Otherwise, Michael, it does take from a, uh, a study by the London University, it takes anywhere from um, 18 days to 254 days to form a habit. And during, and that's the hard way, during the course of forming that habit, you, you, have, you have what they call habit fails. You, you know, you, you fail to engage in the habit for a week at a time, and then you re-engage. So that's the hard way to do it. The, the fast track is, is really the, the, the habit stacking and also associating with uh, people who have the habits that you want. Sure. It's quite clearly shown that you become like the people you associate with. Tom, thank you very much for the, taking the time to ha have this chat today. I'm looking forward to doing this on a regular basis. So can we come back next week and do another session? I can't wait, Michael. I'll be looking forward to it. My pleasure. Thank you very much, Tom. <laughs>